very British stories of World War II. Out of the bleakness of war, and certainly World War II was the worst, there are shining examples and stories of human strangeness and camaraderie that brighten even the darkest situations. The British are known for their eccentricity, from tea drinking to their obsession with dogs, but what is lesser known is the impact these activities had on their mentality and even their armed forces during wartime. Carrots help you see in the dark. If, as a child, you've ever sat at a dinner table that you're not allowed to leave until you eat all your vegetables, then you've probably also heard the common phrase, if you eat your carrots, you'll be able to see better in the dark. But what many people don't know is that this popular myth began all the way back in World War II. While it's true carrots actually contain properties that are good for your eye health, like being super high in vitamin A, this doesn't mean that you'll suddenly be able to see in the dark like a cat. What carrots actually do is preserve your existing eye health and function. The curator of the World Carrot Museum, John Stolarczyk, shares the story of how this myth was popularized. During World War II, Britain was subject to strict rationing and few food options, with many of the more popular food products like meat, tinned goods, fats, bacon, and cheese all being strictly rationed, so as to avoid bulk purchasing by a few individuals to the detriment of others. One thing that was in abundance, however, was carrots. That's why at the beginning of the war, the British Ministry of Agriculture launched a new campaign, Dig for Victory. The concept of this was simple. With a lack of food resources in the shops, it encouraged British citizens to instead grow their own food at home. The campaign involved radio broadcasts, posters, leaflets, and new recipes highlighting the honest potato and good old carrot. They even produced mascots of the two, named Potato Pete and Dr. Carrot. But those weren't the only parts of the carrot campaign. At the time, England was plunged into darkness at night so as to minimize the threat from German air raids. But due to the darkness, there was an increased number of road accidents throughout the year. To try to counteract this somehow, the government claimed that if people ate carrots, they'd be able to see better in the dark and dodge out of the way of oncoming cars and other dangers. To further make these foods even more attractive to the public, the ministry claimed that carrots were responsible for great feats by British pilots. When John Cunningham, an RAF pilot, successfully shot down numerous enemy planes at night using the top-secret AI, or Airborne Interception Radar, the ministry instead told the British public that his victory was down to his excessive carrot eating that let him see better in the dark. This myth allowed the British to hide this new technology from the Germans and earned Cunningham the nickname Cat Eyes. So without World War II, children everywhere wouldn't believe that carrots helped them see better in the dark. Winston Churchill's Siren Suit During the war, the dignified British Prime Minister Winston Churchill was often pictured wearing his famous siren suits, leading them to become a symbol of the wartime leader. The suit itself was actually invented by Churchill, and the inspiration for it is believed to have been taken from the boiler suits or overalls he used to wear when he was an amateur bricklayer in his youth. The historian William Patterson claims the suit was also similar to the outfits Churchill had worn before the war when he worked around his home, the country house Chartwell, tending to his horticultural interests in the grounds of the estate. The suit had a double purpose, both practical and symbolic. Practically, Churchill's siren suit was a simple coverall that would be put on over any of his clothes, or even his pajamas at a moment's notice if necessary. This was essential to give him an air of respect among the general public if a siren warning were ever to go off at night or unexpectedly during the day, hence the name Siren Suit. He would never be caught unawares in his nightclothes, which would be extremely embarrassing for the British Prime Minister and make him a laughingstock. Fighting for fair injury compensation? You need battlefield support from the largest injury law firm in the USA, Morgan & Morgan. With Morgan & Morgan, you can submit a claim without having to get up from your couch. War is fought using the latest tech. Morgan & Morgan has modernized the process of communicating with your legal team as well. No more hours spent poring over field maps of paperwork or spending hours shouting into a walkie-talkie or online. In eight clicks or less, you can submit a claim to Morgan & Morgan and they'll have all your intel ready to review. If you're injured and don't know where to start with Morgan & Morgan, it's so easy to feel like you have dedicated troops ready to fight for your needs. They've helped over 3 million soldiers receive their fair compensation, recovering over $15 billion for their clients. Dial Pound Law from your cell phone or visit www.forthepeople.com slash simple history to see how Morgan & Morgan can help you get back on the battlefield.
Symbolically, though, the suit was arguably even more important. By donning the overalls, Churchill sent a message to the British public, no nonsense, get to work and go about your business. An important message that tied in well with Britain's motto of, keep calm and carry on. The Brits do take comfort in some strange ideals. Tommy Tea Breaks. When an awkward situation arises or something needs dealing with, what's the first thing the British do? Put a kettle on and make a brew, of course. The British have become almost synonymous with tea drinking, considering it a huge part of their culture. So much so that tea breaks became an important consideration during World War II and were taken extremely seriously by the British public, and even more so, its soldiers. This was especially true after 1940 when the worst possible thing that could happen to a British person happened. Tea rationing began. The British public were outraged, and politicians scrambled with how to reassure the nation with a cuppa, leading to the hilarious statement by the Minister of Food, Lord Walton. Politically, I am always warned against interfering with people's tea. As air raids became more frequent and the mood of the nation darkened, the Home Publicity Division of the Ministry of Information began to deliberately highlight the association of tea and comfort in the British subconscious. One message was that neighbors should provide each other with a cup of tea and chat during or after an air raid. By 1944, the government was distributing propaganda that encouraged the idea that drinking tea was an essential part of winning the war, with slogans like, always drink tea, and tea is good for you. Tea became a national icon, a drink of encouragement for soldiers and civilians alike a clever PR campaign that joined the British people together and in some small way let those at home feel like they were supporting the soldiers abroad by joining them in a brew. The British Paradogs. Dogs truly are a man's best friend, and never was that so true as in World War II, when the British actually trained them to parachute out of airplanes alongside their human companions. The South Lancashire 13th Parachute Battalion was the main division, although certainly not the only to use paradogs, as they were charmingly nicknamed during the war, later even utilizing them in the D-Day landings. They began with five paradogs, including one who had been captured from the Germans. Their names were Bing, whose civilian name was Brian, Flash, Monty, Rainy, and Bob, and they all deserved the same recognition as the humans who fought alongside them. The intention of using dogs was to help soldiers on the ground by identifying booby traps, mines, and other dangerous obstacles. Incredibly, after a short while, these dogs were actually trained to jump from an airplane just like a human would and parachute to the ground. And like any other dog training, treats were always on hand to reward them. On D-Day, June 6, 1944, when they made the drops with their human counterparts, the soldiers found the dog's identification and sniffing skills highly useful. But sadly, like many humans, Monty and Rainey didn't survive the conflict. Bing, aka Brian, survived and was awarded the Dickon Medal for his service, the UK's highest honor for animals who have displayed devotion to duty under the armed forces or civil defense units. After he died in 1955, he was buried in a cemetery that honored animals like himself, and his likeness commemorates him, living on in the Parachute Regiment and Airborne Forces Museum in Duxford, still wearing his famous parachute. Although these peculiar stories are uniquely British, each nation had its own unusual and funny ways and means of coping with war, whether on the home front or right there on the front lines.